Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And you know, last week we were talking about the F-102 and we are going to jump up to the successor, the last pure interceptor designed for the United States Air Force. This was uh, a beginning to be known actually as the F-102B, but later became the F-106, another Convair product. It had a, a lot of firsts that we're gonna talk about, but it was essentially a rocket ship. And Greg today has really outdone himself. You know, last week I had the, the animated pig Today, I am the Rocket Man. What do you think, Greg? I am the Rocket Man. So there we go. And I am going to, we got one of those fine aviation products going off because we're outside. Gonna lose this, there's the hat. I'm gonna take off the glasses as well because these are just frightening. There we go. I'm gonna put these on because we're outside. Now today, Greg is my bid, uh, biddable, biddable assistant. I don't know what a biddable assistant is. Today we're going to talk about the F-106. Now the F-106 was the successor to the F-102. You got to remember we're moving out of World War II and kind of these small dogfighter airplanes, dogfighting airplanes, and we're now stepping up into what we talked about uh, last week, which was dealing with the really sad reality that both the United States and the Soviet Union had embarked on a, a plan of what they called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, and both sides were armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And so what they were doing is they had a lot of weapons pointing at each other. They were in submarines, they were in rockets, and they were in airplanes, much like this airplane that's gonna be taking off behind me right now. Here goes another one. Oh, look at that. There goes another nice airliner here in Palm Springs. So the idea was the United States wanted these interceptors to be able to negate the uh, Russian uh, airborne threat of nuclear weapons. Remember, we don't really have cruise missiles at this time. We're going to have to fly a bomb in to have some precision to drop it. Now you have to also think about the reality for both sides with these weapons, whatever they were flying, that this was most likely a one-way trip, if you can believe that, Greg, a one-way trip. There you were going to go, you're going to detonate, detonate that bomb in a horrific uh, nuclear war. If you survive the blast and the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse, there was just no place to go. At this point, we're, thank goodness we never did that, but we were lobbing immensely destructive weapons at each other. So this aircraft was really designed to negate the ability of the Russians to fly nukes into the continental United States or to attack some of the outlying areas or perhaps even Europe. Now it was a purebred interceptor. We're still dealing with a centerline weapons bay door, which is kind of interesting. You know what's really interesting about this, Greg, is we went with the F-4 Phantom, the F-16, the F-15, and all these aircraft with external stores, right? In other words, they were hung off the wings. In these fighters, there were weapons bays. Where, what have we gone back to with the F-22 and the F-35? Weapons bays. To, and and to, that was uh, all designed now to reduce the radar cross-section of the airplane. So these were using uh, improved versions of the Falcon or they had finned rockets. I'm going to talk about another variation on this airplane here in a minute. But uh, let's get into it. This aircraft, it uh, first flew in 1956. It was introduced to the United States Air Force in 1959. It was purely an interceptor. It was a Mach 2.3 fighter. It flew at 2.3 Mach. It actually uh, set a couple of world speed records at about 1,500 miles an hour. You can believe that. It also had a bit of a challenge, although this is a, a B model of the airplane, a two-seat version of the airplane, which we'll talk about in a minute, that did you know that, Greg, the first 12 guys who ejected out of this airplane didn't make it? It had ejection seat problems. So early on, this was not an aircraft that you wanted to punch out of. It had ejection seat issues. 
but once it got through its teething issues, it was actually uh, pretty amazing. It was also the second highest sequential aircraft in the Air Force, and what I mean by that is like F-102, F-106, and F-111, and then guess what happened, Greg? It reset. We reset the sequence. We went back to the other airplanes. Now, it initially, they were talking about that this aircraft was going to be uh, powered by a Rolls-Royce uh, Bristol Olympus engine. That didn't happen, and what eventually happened was it was uh, powered by a Pratt, a J-75. Now, interesting fact about that Bristol Olympus engine, guess what? Where did it go? It kept being refined. It actually be moved into the Concorde series of airplanes. It had quite a long life on that engine, but it didn't make it into this airplane. Um, this aircraft, as you can see, is about, from a geometry uh, size, about the same size as the F-102, but they've refined. Remember we talked about the aerial rule or the Whitcomb rule? They have refined the Coke bottle. You can really see the differential in the wing in the center portion of the airplane on this aircraft. And this airplane now signifies aircraft that were uh, pretty much sorted out. And what I mean by that, and, and Greg, uh, these aircraft were stable in all axes of flight. Now, where am I going with that, Craig? You're saying, Fred, where are you going with that? Well, these were relatively stable airframes. You're still talking about the Delta Wing. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. But what they've done, if you go into the F-16, and Greg can throw up some graphics on this, and some of these modern airplanes, and the F-117, for example, those aircraft are not stable in one or more axes of flight. In other words, they're unstable. And what's keeping them flying is that fly-by-wire, that box in the airplane that is sensing how the airplane has to go. In the old days, remember, they didn't have that. This was all mechanical, right? So they had to make the airplane relatively stable. The, what is the benefit of that, Greg is asking? The benefit is that you can get the airplane to do tighter and more aggressive maneuvers, or an example, or in the F-117's case, what they called the hopeless diamond, right? A play on the hope diamond, is that you can take an airframe. The F-117 was designed really to evade radar. It wasn't designed necessarily to be a stable airplane. So what they ended up doing is as they got away from these aircraft, what they started doing is playing with the flight dynamics of the airplane. And Greg, as I said, can throw up some graphics that can talk about stability in flight and the various axes of flight but this was really kind of the last group of what I would call aerodynamically stable airplanes until we moved off into, as we got more and more sophisticated in flight controls, and one of the things that this airplane was involved in, which we'll talk about, is they got more and more involved in um, computers and in-flight guidance with computers. We got further and further into uh, unstable aircraft, but we were able to compensate for that with the, uh, the onboard computers and the flight control systems. Now, um, this airplane, the design of this airplane, has one unique thing, Greg, and that is it was the cornfield bomber. The cornfield bomber, you're saying, what is that? Well, there was an F-106 that had a problem, and it went into a flat spin, and it had a propulsion issue, and so it was in a flat spin, the pilot said, hey, I'm out of here, and he punched out. Well, when he punched out, remember, and this is where I was going with stable airplanes. Think about this and how stable the airplane was. When he punched out, he changed the weight ratio on the front of the airplane. The airplane came out of the spin and actually landed flat in a cornfield. It survived. The airplane was actually repaired and returned to service, if you can believe that. It landed completely pilotless, and it's actually in the Air Force Museum right now. Can you believe that, Greg? The airplane survived. I, that is still amazing to me, but that is the epitome, and Greg is like going, where are you headed with this, Fred? That is the epitome of stable airplanes, right? That The guy jumps out of the airplane, the airplane rights itself, eventually loses speed and just slides into a cornfield. Now, this aircraft 
and uh, there were 342 built. In air combat maneuvering, it was good. And you got to remember, it was going up against uh, primarily F-4s. It could outmaneuver an F-4, if you can believe that. Air four, F-4 did not have as good a turning characteristic of this airplane, which for me is hard to believe given what we know about Delta Wings, but it, it, it actually uh, turned better and performed better. But the Air Force, in looking at the F-4 compared to this aircraft, felt that the F-4 was a stronger candidate because it could hang weapon stores off the wings, which this airplane could not do. And it had something else, Greg. It had that guy in the back seat that could manage the weapon. So you got the benefit of two people in the airplane. You could increase the tasks. And so this aircraft eventually faded out of service in 1988. It went on to be a drone. They used it a lot. Then it also had another life. Another exciting thing, and that was these two seat versions, they went to work for NASA out until 1998, if you can believe that. They went to work for NASA, and they also worked as chase airplanes. One of the things they did for NASA was they um, actually used this airplane to get it struck by lightning to see what would happen. Cause flashes along the left side. God, I think we got a strike. A direct strike. Delayed triggers, but we got it. Oh, that one crackling. I, mean, I yeah. think one of these aircraft was hit 72 times by lightning in part of the NASA project. So that is just totally crazy. And then it was also used in a flight test roll. Now, I'm going to pick up my handy dandy model here and I'm going to show you the plan view. Greg can look at the plan view of the airplane. You can see that classic delta shape. You can also see that tapering right there, the Whitcomb or the area rule. You could see that there, uh, right in there. Remember we had that, uh, that uh, J-75 engine in the tail. On the bottom you can see that center weapons bay there that would carry those and again that's uh, interesting that that's actually come back into vogue to clean up the bottom of the airplane now there's one thing about that this that's kind of cool greg and that is that the uh they did experiment with this with a vulcan cannon in here they learned from the um f-102 that they they it was called projects they always come up with pretty obvious names project six shooter why not, right? So they put a Vulcan cannon in there. That was in the 19, early 1970s, but eventually they got away from it and uh, they just decided that they were going to go with a whole new airframe. So before I get into the history of this particular airframe, I'm going to put this down. Now I want to talk today about Greg has upped his game. We have not been getting this magnet to stick to anything. So this is a, a continuous evolution of gratuitous product placement. It's stuck. So Greg, you have redeemed yourself. I, the, the thing is, do you have to carry around this big chunk of metal so you can actually prove to people that it sticks? Greg is nodding his head. So uh, I have a big hunk of really nasty metal here that I'm going to make sure I do not drop. And what I'm going to do now is Greg has gone to my stage two. He's given me another one today. This is Dad's Old Fashioned Root Beer. Greg, this is a little mainstream here. I know what this one is. You're slipping. We, you, know, you have to be drinking like lizard juice or something. Um, but this is Dad's, 170 calories. All the usual um, includes... 43 grams of added sugar, which is 90% of your daily allowance. So this thing is packed with sugar. I don't see a sell-by date, but it's a fairly well-known brand. So I have another one of those fine aviation products go past me. So today what I'm going to salute is there weren't a lot of these aircraft made. There were 342 of all of the variants made, but if you flew one of these, I salute you. This is 
you were the, the last of the line of a dying breed of gunfighters, this, this airplane, or pure interceptors, and uh, this was a change in history. So if you flew the 106, I salute you. Greg, you can't go wrong with Dad's root beer. This is two weeks in a row. Of course, I'm going to lapse into a sugar coma here probably pretty soon. Mm. So if you flew the 106, I salute you. I am going to put that down only because my family is watching this, and I told them how much sugar was in this thing. So I will take a tremendous amount of use when I get home. Of course, we are back to the Century Series fighter. People have asked, are we going to get a Voodoo? People ask us that. We are going to get a Voodoo. We actually have a Voodoo in waiting. We know where the one is that we're going to get. We just have a lot of airplanes we're restoring right now. And so, but the Voodoo will come in and we will complete the series so that we'll have all the Century Series fighters in the collection. But you can go out to our store and pick one of these bad boys up. As I said, it will make you 15 miles an hour faster. You will be able to eject from this airplane and survive. What do you think, Greg? That, that's a pretty bold statement. If you can make it work, go ahead. If not, you just jump out. But uh, this is a very nice shirt. I've worn these uh, on the program many times. And uh, people will come up, actually have guys come up when I wear this shirt, people come up and stop me and go, where do I get one of those? So that's exciting, isn't it, Greg? They, that we actually make something that somebody wants, which is exciting. So let's talk about this airplane in particular. This so this is a unique airplane in that it was part of the El Paso 6. This is one of the last complete aircraft that was ever sold out of the boneyard. The museum, there's a very generous donor who I do not have permission to use his name, but I will say thank you very much to the donor. A donor gave us this airplane. It is complete, like the F-100 and like the F-104. These airplanes in our collection are complete. Avionics, engines, the whole nine yards. This particular airplane, there was a gentleman that was going to restore this airplane, and he passed away. He was actually going to fly it, if you can believe that. And uh, so we got the airplane. It was actually in, in very, very good condition. Now, when we did the research, the other exciting thing about this aircraft was, Greg, it was actually part of the B-1B flight test program up until the late 90s, the early 2000s. When we restored this aircraft, you look at the tail, when you come to the museum, you can actually see, we actually put the chase uh, emblem back on the airplane. But 509 was actually part of that program. So this is not a, what I would call a mojo paint job. This airplane actually flew in this livery, and it was used along with three other ones. I think Greg can throw that up. Uh, that actually were part of that program, the B-1B, which is kind of exciting. That was really the last use of these airplanes. This aircraft had a, an in-flight um, avionics fire somewhere in the airplane. They had uh, something shorted out, and that is what saved the airplane. And if you come here today, or you come when you come to the museum, you can actually see on the side of the airplane the flight test pilots have actually signed the airplane. So we continue, the pilots who flew this airplane in flight test have come and signed the airplane. So again, we have brought the airplane back to the individuals that actually flew it. The emblem on the airplane is also uh, accurate in that this is a California girl, Greg. This airplane never left California for its entire life. It was stationed here. And actually, I think Greg may, able, may be able to find some throwback pictures, this airplane actually had a landing mishap as well uh, when it was an operational service, and Greg may be able to find those as well. So that today is the overview on the F-106, a not a prolifically produced airplane, but an important airplane in the uh, stepping stone to some of these more aggressive uh, air superiority fighters, and the last of the line in the pure interceptors. Now what I want you to do today is I want you to go out on that YouTube channel, hit the like button, give us a thumbs up, smash that subscribe button. If you're on Facebook, hit that Facebook like button. Remember, this is another example of aircraft that we restore. We can't do it without your donations. 
So get over there and give us a donation if you can do it. And I want to thank you. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.